YOLO V6L6 state-of-the-art object detection. Oh yeah? But have you seen YOLO V8 state-of-the-art YOLO model? YOLO NAS beats YOLO V6 and YOLO V8. Grounding Dino state-of-the-art zero-shot object detection? One former, one transformer to rule universal image segmentation with freaking 12 state-of-the-art badges. YOLO 9000, better, faster, stronger. How do I know which model is state-of-the-art if every model is state-of-the-art? Yeah, today we are talking about model selection. Let me just start by saying that you are probably overthinking that decision. The truth is that top models in any computer vision category, but for sure in object detection and image segmentation, are super close to each other when it comes to performance and accuracy. If there is one thing that I would like you to remember from this video is that spending time to build high quality computer vision data set is probably much better investment than picking exactly the top model. Having the best possible data set and top five model will probably take you very far, potentially very close to optimal scenario when you have top model and top data set. Having said that, there are definitely some factors that you need to take into consideration, and I hope that this video will help you to do that. First of all, you need to put the model in the context of business use case that you're trying to solve and the hardware that you will use. Let's assume for a second that you will build an application that will count how many people are traveling by public transport in your city. That will probably require using model capable of running in real time, because if it runs at 5 FPS, good luck plugging in some tracker and getting reliable count. You probably need to take into account the internet connection, or should I rather say lack of internet connection, that will force you to run that model on some low compute board like Jetson Nano. And if that's the case, then you need to make sure that your model is as lightweight as possible, both as a static file, but also in terms of memory consumption after it's loaded. On the other hand, you will probably be able to get away with object detection instead of instant segmentation. Of course, you can use mask, but they will probably not give you a lot of boost when it comes to accuracy, but will definitely significantly slow down your processing. On the other hand, you can just as well work in a project where you analyze medical images. And in that case, nobody probably cares about the speed of your model, as long as it is something reasonable, probably like a few seconds per image, but you definitely don't need to run at 500 FPS. You will also have access to cloud compute, so any hardware limitations are pretty much non-existent, of course, as long as your company can afford those machines. But what people will definitely care about is the accuracy and the precision of your predictions. So I assume you will go with some large-scale instant segmentation model. Next up is hardware. Nowadays, your model can run in the cloud, on the edge, on the phone, in the browser, and you need to be able to deliver your model to that specific platform. That's why interoperability is such a big factor. Models do not exist in the vacuum. They are usually part of libraries, and the library can make it very hard or very easy to deploy that model on different hardware or in different runtime. Positive examples in this category are definitely YOLO V5 and the Tektron 2. I had the pleasure to work with both of them and they allow you to convert model to endless amount of interchangeable formats so you can run your model in Java, in C++ or in Python. It doesn't really matter. Now it's time to address the elephant in the room, the MAP versus latency chart. This is pretty much what you have in your mind when we talk about benchmarking and comparing different models. And I know there's a lot of sarcasm in my voice when I said MAP versus latency chart. Uh, don't get me wrong, this is awesome tool when you want to compare the potential of the model. However, there are some important factors that are often overlooked and I'm here to tell you all about them. Okay, let's take a look at one of the latest and greatest object detection models, Yolonas. In principle, the closer the model is to the top left corner, the better. That means that it is both fast and accurate at the same time. However, the specific values that are visible on a chart are tied to specific hardware and dataset that was used for benchmarking. 
essentially, the more powerful hardware you use, the lowest latency you can expect. This specific benchmark was done on NVIDIA T4, and if you are going to use NVIDIA T4 on production, that's awesome. You probably can expect similar performance of your model. However, if you are not, and as we already established, we live in quite interesting time when you can run your model pretty much anywhere, then you have a problem. You don't really know what is the performance of your model, what is the latency that you can expect. I would suggest you would do some tests before you spend months building an application around that model and fine tune it on your custom data set, go through multiple rounds of annotation, stuff like that. Just run the simplest possible version of your application, optimally just the model, no video analytics overhead, and confirm what is the actual FPS that you can expect on your target hardware. Now the MAP part, my favorite. Don't get me wrong, I'm human too. I love the idea of being able to quantify the performance of the model with single value. That would be awesome. <laughs> However, that specific value is obtained on Coco dataset. This is pretty much the standard when it comes to benchmarking object detection and instance segmentation models. I'm not sure if you ever had an opportunity to take a look at specific examples of images coming from that data set. But I think that phone is actually one of the coolest examples of class that is in Coco data set, but your model wouldn't be able to detect most of modern phones. If you will go into that data set, most of the phones back there were flip phones or those large Nokia brick phones. That data set is pretty old and any technology that is there is pretty much outdated. The point I'm making is that you will probably need to fine tune your model on your own custom data set. And in that case, that MAP value from that chart is going right out the window. If you are going to fine tune, we are pretty much going back to one of the first sentences I made in that video. Quality of your data set will have significantly higher impact on the performance of your model on production than model selection. Some of you are probably thinking, but if my model is better on Coco data set, then surely it will be better on my own custom data set. And the answer is no, there is no guarantee that it will happen. The variance of MAP when you fine tune that on your custom data set is so large that when we've done a test on the RoboFlow 100 data set, in many cases, it was 50-50. We tested two model and on 50% of data set, model A was better and on 50% of data sets, model B was better. So keep that in mind. Don't overthink the fact that one model is better than the other by 1% of MAP. Okay, now let's switch the gears and focus on things that are probably less intuitive or at least less talk about, but in my mind, they are equally important. The things that you usually don't think about until you start to build application around your model. First of all, how easy it is to actually use that model. Can I just peep install it and it will add the library and the model to my environment? Or do I need to go through multiple pages of readme instructions just to set it up? This is important because especially in computer vision, but also in NLP, in many cases, model can require some additional steps that are specific to the platform. For example, compiling custom CUDA kernels or installing some obscure deep learning framework that is no longer supported. Yep, I'm talking about you, Darknet. So like I said before, if the difference in MAP is not that significant, but on the other hand, proper packaging can literally save you days of development and integration work, perhaps you should take that into consideration. Here are a few positive examples worth mentioning, like recently released YOLO V8 package or Transformers library from Hugging Face, which is pretty much setting up the industry standard in that regard. Ah, and small pro tip, it is great idea to take a look if the library offers ready to use Docker images or at least Docker files. Those can certainly bootstrap your development and save a lot of your life that you would probably spend Googling or like kids now in the days do, talking to ChatGPT. Now let's make a wild assumption and assume that you manage to install your model. Like I said before, depending on your specific use case, you may only want to detect or segment objects, 
or those detections are just a starting point, the input to other part of your application. Maybe you are going to count people crossing the line or objects in the zone. By the way, we have videos on both of those use cases. So if you are curious, feel free to take a look. But in that case, your model is just a small block that will form the overall application. And what you need is SDK that will allow you to plug and play. Up until quite recently, SDKs were quite rare. Starting from Yolo v3 up to, I believe, Yolo v7, the whole repository was usually built around the idea of scripts that allowed you to train, detect, or export models. If you wanted to do anything custom, you were pretty much forced to fork the repo and do all the plumbing by yourself. Next on my list is checking whether or not the project is actively supported. This is actually pretty easy. You can just visit their GitHub repository and check when they last committed new code or do they actively solve and manage new issues. I personally would stay away from abandoned projects, especially if you are new to computer vision. Of course, you can always count on the community, but the community is usually stronger in active projects and a lot weaker in projects that are no longer supported. That's another important factor to take into consideration. Last but not least, the license. This is basically a legal document that describes if and how you can use the model in your project. Those licenses can, of course, be very open and permissive or not necessarily. So it's always a good idea to read the license to understand what is allowed. MIT and Apache license are probably the most permissive. You can use the model however you want. You can build your whole business around it. They don't care. Unfortunately, they are quite rare recently. Most of the projects use quite complicated licenses. So if you are not sure, reach out to creators, ask questions. They will probably know the best. Ah, and if you really like the model architecture, but you found that model in the library with the license that makes you unhappy, there is a chance that the same model got re-implemented in multiple other libraries. So take a look. Maybe it will have a more permissive license in different library. And that's it. I know you probably have other things on your list. I'm actually curious about what you take into consideration when you select the model. I absolutely expect comparisons to Yannick in comments below. I fully expect that given my shades. When you will be there in comment section, make sure to like and subscribe so you wouldn't miss any videos coming in the future. And as usual, my name is Peter and I see you next time. Bye.